good? All right, thanks for coming. You're all tardy, you all get demerits. You can all see me after class. Thanks for coming out. We're gonna have to get going a little bit because I do have an extra page of notes for, than I normally do. <laughs> so this week, the, uh, the lesson is called The Cosmos is Calling, and we'll be considering uh, some things from the cosmological argument or the branch of apologetics of cosmology and the cosmological models. So I have at the top Psalm 19, 1 through 3, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utters forth speech and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is nor speech nor language where their voice is not heard. All right, so I need you guys to grab three passages real quick. I'm going to do a little bit of review. 1 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Timothy 3, 2 Timothy 2, and 1 Corinthians 11. So in light of pastor's sermon last week, I decided to, to do one little section here of review of the last three classes. Um, so introduction up to this point, we have seen some introductions to apologetics. We have looked at what it is, how it is used, the issues surrounding the debate. Today we'll begin looking at some of the positive arguments for the existence of God and how we can learn through the science <clears throat> and how what we learn through the sciences confirms what we know to be true in the scriptures. Before we go on, I would like to make one point in review. In lesson one, we found that we as Christians have a responsibility to study, teach, preach, exhort, rebuke, and evangelize. I would like to revisit this in light of Pastor's sermon last week. Pastor made the assertion that heresy or a heretic is someone who believes and teaches error. This is for the purpose of self-advancement by creating factions or sects. Heresy is ultimately the work of the flesh and driven by pride. So if you want to no more and you weren't here last week, get on the church website, look at his pastor's sermon from last Sunday. And uh, the reason why is, as he was making some points, I was kind of listening along. I was like, darn it, this would have went really good in lesson one. I wish I would have you know, seen this before. So I want to bring it to your attention now. So starting in 1 Timothy chapter 3, if you guys can get there, 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we know this passage, uh, 1 through 10, is dealing with the requirements of bishops and with deacons. And basically, what this is, is this is the model man, right? In Christendom, this is what the model man looks like. These are the attributes that any Christian guy, if he wants to be a pastor or a bishop or a deacon, needs to model this. So, we're looking at the model man here, and I want to draw your attention to a couple things here. Uh, verse 1, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop must be blameless, husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. And it goes down through this whole list. But I want to go down to verse 6, drop down to verse 6. Not a novice, lest he be lifted up with pride and he fall into the condemnation of the devil pastor's sermon was about how the pride of the flesh and a work of the flesh is what deals with these heresies. Novice, obviously, is someone who is new and doesn't know how to use the Bible, doesn't know the Bible well, is perhaps unlearned in this area. Also drop down to verse 10. Let these also first be proved. Let them use... <clears throat> then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. So, th these bishops and deacons are called to not be novices, and they're called to be proved first. If we're going to allow them to preach and teach, they must be proved. So, it, if we read 1 Timothy 3, 1-10, through 10, we see the qualifications for bishops and deacons. In chapter 4, he instructs Timothy to be an example. The example or model that he is supposed to be is given in chapter 3. So this is the list of what all Christians should strive to follow. The two I'd like to point out were in verse 6, not a novice, lest he be lifted up in pride. In verse 10, also first be proved. The novice, I believe, deals with the study part, but what about the proving part? So go to the 2 Timothy 2. So 
2 Timothy 2:15 2, through 26. We know this is the study to show yourself proven unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So how am I going to show myself approved unto God in that verse? Studying to rightly divide, correct? So how then does that look practically? How does that physically look? And that's the question we're dealing with. You know, and, and as you go down through the rest of the passage, through 26, you see how that looks in practicality, right? When there is heresies, when there are objections, when there are false teachings, someone who is studying to show themselves approved can go out, spot that, discern that, and then deal with that. So we see that study to show ourselves <clears throat> approved, but how? Rightly dividing the word of truth, but this is all just to, but is this that all we're doing is knowing for knowing's sake, or do we need to apply it? As we read down through the passage, we see that our call to study has application in teaching and instruction. Chapter 4, to preach and evangelize. So go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This was the passage pastor was in last week that kind of started this all out with dealing with heresies. 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 19. Now in this, that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must all be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. So we see that heresy has a benefit of manifesting those that are approved. So then how it works is that all Christians are called to study the word, be diligent in the doctrine. Then when adversary arises in the form of heresies, whether in or out of the church, these people show that they are approved by being able to identify and correct the error. They are also able to teach others why the heresy is error and recover those who oppose themselves by following the heresy. This is one way we can vet or prove those who desire to teach. Can they see and deal with error? This is what all Christians are called to model. So again, you know, I wish I could have included that in the first lesson, but I didn't hear Pastor's sermon until last week. So if you want to see it more fully, see Pastor's sermon from last week on heresies in the church and, and dealing with those and whatever else, and then tying that in with our apologetic mission and our task to be able to do that. So, uh, page two, top of page two, cosmological argument. So I have here, I would now like to turn to arguments for the existence of God. These arguments often are based in sciences and math. The strength of them lies in that they are concerned with what the facts show is the most likely explanation. So as Michael Behe states, that arguments based on science and math are beneficial, saying, quote, First of all, it is immune to the argument of evil. It matters not a whit to the scientific case whether the designer is good or bad, interested or disinterested. It only matters whether an explanation of design appears to be consistent with the biological examples I point to. Second, questions about whether the designer is omnipotent or even especially competent do not arise in my case as they did in Pele's. Darwinism on the microscope, page 130. So, the beauty of these arguments is that they show without needing to appeal to religious writings that an intelligent agent must have created and designed the universe and things we find in it. So why, why we say that, and what I mean by that is, if we go to some of these scientific and mathematical arguments for the existence of God, they are immune to any religious baggage that atheists might throw on it and say, well, how can your God be so good because of this or whatever else? It doesn't matter to this argument because all this argument deals with is what are the facts of science and math? Here's the facts, what do the facts point to? We don't care at this point, we don't care what does God look like, what does he actually do? All we care about is, is there a God? And that's all these arguments deal with is, is there a designer, is there a creator? We can further figure that out, obviously, from Scripture and whatever else, what God is, who He is, what He wants, all that kind of stuff. But for these arguments, the nice part about them is, with another intellectual, they can't bring up that stuff. 
or if they do, you can, you can benchmark it and say, okay, we'll talk about that later, but right now let's just deal with these brute facts. If these brute facts say there is a God, well, now we can talk about, well, what does he look like? What does he do? And all that stuff. So the first argument I would like to consider is a cosmological argument. So remember from lesson one that a cosmological argument is an argument based on cause and effect. Everything that begins to exist must have a sufficient cause. Since the universe began to exist, the universe therefore must have a sufficient cause, and that cause is God. The cosmo, the cosmo has several variations that have been defended throughout history. The next two formal arguments are some examples. So first, the Kalam version. Whatever begins to exist has a cause for its coming into being. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause for its coming into being. G.W. Leibniz expanded the argument as follows. Anything that exists has an explanation of its existence, either by the necessity of its own nature or in an external cause. If the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is God. Top of page three. The universe does exist, therefore, the universe has an explanation of its existence, if you compare one and three. Therefore, the explanation of the existence of the universe is God from two and four. So these can be confusing, so I'll attempt to illustrate these and explain them so that they will be easier, <clears throat> they will be useful and easier to remember. I'll break them down into steps uh, with two possible scenarios and we will see which one makes more sense. Each of these splits only has two possible answers based on the law of non-contradiction and the law of excluded middle. Based on these laws, only two options are available. So, this is one of the easiest to remember if you diagram it out. So we start with the cosmo, cosmos, the universe, all right? So the first question we can ask, does the cosmos exist or not? And that's the question. It's either or, there is, no, there is no middle ground in that. The middle ground is or. It either exists or it does not exist. So that's the question that we're starting with. So Hebrews 1.3 says, quote, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the power of his word, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand in the majesty on high. Our first junction is the question of do we exist at all? Is the universe real or just an illusion like a concept of the matrix? This is often attributed to Ludwig, Ludwig Boltzmann, who proposed that the universe could possibly be just an imagination of a single existent mind. Referred to as Boltzmann's brain, the idea spawned all kinds of theories into the universe's existence or lack thereof. Multiverse and alternate universes became popularized um, by Hollywood, I think that's one word, in movies like The Matrix. 13th floor and in inception where reality is not the way it seems although entertaining and interesting is there any reason to believe that this is the case the answer is no there is no scientific philosophical or theological proofs for the multiverse or to say that we are all just illusions the burden of proof lies not on the believer not in the believer of the universe but in the skeptic why believe that we are illusions what actual proof can you give and what you find in atheism often requires more faith than Christianity. So there are not a lot of people on this side. It's, it's very, very few. Most people you talk to, especially on the street, they're going to say, yes, I exist. Yes, the universe exists. We are real. We are here. It's becoming more popular to say, well, maybe there's a multiverse, maybe there's multiple universes and alternate realities and everything like that. But there is literally no scientific evidence for that. There can't be. Science only deals with things that are, things that I can observe with my five senses and test empirically. Obviously, an alternate reality or an extra dimension or something has no testability or viability in science. So science cannot say that this is even a possibility. They like to say that because they want to, you know, they don't want to be over here because this ultimately leads bad and they don't want to go there. No, but to say that there's no, to say that it's not would be a philosophical presupposition. Not right. A scientific right. Presupposition. This is this. Yeah. And even in philosophy, this is dumb. I mean, yes. most 
philosophers are not going to say that. They know that at least I exist. I can question my own existence. You might all be illusions of mine, but I know I exist. <laughs> so it doesn't matter if the universe doesn't exist the way I think it does. It's still existence. I still exist. So I know I exist. Therefore, there is an existence of some universe, even if it isn't the way I think it is. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Okay, so the next question under that is, did the cosmos begin to exist or always exist? So did it begin or just exist from eternity? So that's the next question. Did the universe always exist or did it have a beginning? So Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So we know what the Bible already teaches about this. If you're going to go the theological route, the Bible says it began to exist. So some persons will re maintain that the universe always existed and therefore didn't need creating. Without the need for creating, what use is a creator? The problem with that is that it is, again, not what science, philosophy, and theology teach. People will often believe a lie to escape an unpleasantry. Starting with science, here we will be considering Big Bang, the Big Bang Theory. Unlike the children's story of all matter and energy contained to a single dot that got hot then exploded, the real Big Bang Theory is much more radical than that. The true Big Bang Theory states that all matter and energy, along with time and space, came into existence simultaneously. So you guys all remember, you know, probably from school, the Big Bang Theory, and they all said all the matter and energy and everything was contained in this infinitesimally small dot, basically. And because of the pressure and the heat and everything, it expanded and exploded, and that's where everything began. No, the Big Bang Theory is, is bigger than that. There was no dot. There was no space. There was nothing. There was literally nothing. And then for causes that science can't tell us, everything exploded into existence all at one time. So it's not as simple as that, but before, <clears throat> so back to the top of the page four notes. Before this, there was nothing, no dot to float around in space. This is a huge admission by cosmology and science. The Big Bang is a great proof of biblical claims of creation ex nihilo. In 1989, John Maddock, the editor of Nature, a world-renowned science journal, wrote a piece entitled Down with the Big Bang. In it, he states, quote, Apart from being a philosophical, philosophically unacceptable, the Big Bang is an oversimple view of how the universe began, and it is unlikely to survive the decade ahead. Creationists seeking to support their opinions have ample, have ample justification in the Big Bang. So notice what Maddox says. The creationists have justification for their opinion, namely that the universe was created sometime in the definite past. This is, I think, an important point for you to highlight here. Mm -hmm. What the cosmological argument is doing is using the Big Bang against atheists. Correct. Most Christians, when they hear Big Bang, they don't really understand what, they don't really understand how the Big Bang can be used to work in their favor. Right. And they automatically assume evolution. Right, and that's what we're going to take a minute and talk about this because, yeah, everybody hears Big Bang in Christianity. I'm probably going to be called sacrilegious something or other, but the Big Bang theory is not something Christians should fear. How scientists use it, sure. But, honestly, and I just read you, that's a naturalist saying he doesn't like the Big Bang. Why? Because the Big Bang actually supports creation, not evolution. It actually supports the idea that there was a creator because everything literally had to come into existence from nothing. This is a very sticky point in their ideas. The problem is they can't escape it. They tried. They tried to escape it. Einstein, when he first came out with his theory of relativity, realized that this was the implication. That's why he came out with this special relativity right. to get rid of the beginning because he understood the implications that if there was a beginning, it's very likely there was a God. And he also realized that time, space, and matter were all co-relative. Correct. Meaning you can't have one without you can't have one of them without the other two. Right. They're all interrelated and they all came into existence at the same time. 
all matter, energy, time, and space exploded into existence. So I know it's, it's almost impossible to imagine because we want to imagine just empty space, but there wasn't space, there was nothing, and you can't imagine nothing. But that's what science shows us. There was nothing, and then there was everything. So they don't like it. Christians should embrace it to the, to the extent that this is a scientific fact. The universe exploded into existence. That shouldn't surprise us, right? It shouldn't surprise us because that's exactly what Genesis tells us. There was nothing except God, and then he spoke, and the universe exploded into existence. That shouldn't surprise us that if God created the universe, we should see his fingerprints in it in the sciences. The sciences should support the Bible, and they do. So, we're going to look at what is, how do scientists explain the Big Bang? How do they know it actually happened? So, traditionally, back to the notes, traditionally there are five proofs for the Big Bang Theory. A good way to remember them is the acronym SURGE. So, don't think of a Big Bang, think of a Big Surge. So, the S, SURGE, Second Law of Thermodynamics, Entropy and Heat Death. That's what that's dealing with. So, it's... Two, two sides to this one. The law states that the universe is running out of usable energy. Like a running car, the universe will one day run out of gas. This means the universe had to start, uh, had to start up sometime in the near past or we would have run out by now. Also, that things left to themselves tend to disorder. Since there is still order in the universe, this, uh, the universe is still relatively young. So dealing with heat death, that's the, the energy state, okay? When the universe came into existence, lots of heat, but as the universe, and this is a fact, the universe is actually still expanding. It's actually getting bigger every day. We can actually measure how bigger it's getting every day as we look at the stars and see how far they're moving away from us, other galaxies. So the problem is as it expands, it cools down because all the stars are getting farther from each other. They can't feed off each other's heat. Everything is eventually going to run out of fuel. And the whole universe is going to eventually get to a point where it's almost near absolute zero. Nothing can live if it's allowed to just keep going the rate it's going. So the, the implication is then we haven't reached that point yet. Therefore, there can't be an infinite past. If there was an infinite past, we would have already been frozen and dead. The entropy state, this is the order. The universe came into existence with order. It had laws, it, had, it was governed, and it had a, a, a certain amount of order to it. But the natural laws, the way they are, everything is getting worse. This is an admission by science. <laughs> this isn't just a theological admission. This is science telling you everything in the universe is getting worse. It was better in the past and it's getting worse. Everything tends to disorder and chaos. Things break apart, they fall apart. Carbon, you know, the whole half-life of things breaking down into carbon. Eventually, the universe will turn into an absolutely chaotic mess of just random particles, a soup of particles, basically, that just bump into each other and nothing can hold together eventually, if left to its own. We're not to that point yet. Obviously, the universe must have began sometime in the near past. So the second one, U, the universe is expanding. The universe is actually growing and new space is being created every day. We can trace back the growth to the origin at the center of the universe. The rate of expansion is a set rate and grows at a steady pace. So not only is it expanding, but it's speeding up at a constant rate. It's constantly expanding and getting faster at expanding. So again, the, the implication is, if it's expanding, it can't have been expanding forever because it's only so big and we can mathematically figure out its start point based on the rate at that it's expanding. So I think it's important to point out that it's also mathematically collapsible back to a point where right. there's nothing. Right, we can, we can go backwards, say it's, it's it's growing at a rate of 0.0002%, which that's probably faster than it is. But say it's growing at that rate. This rate, though, is a steady increase. It steadily goes up at another rate. We can go backwards then with those two rates and collapse the universe back to a definite 
point in history and say, where it began to right, exist. this is where it began to exist. So from that, we know because it hasn't expanded to the point where we can't see any of the other galaxies or anything anymore, because how they explain this is, the universe is hard to explain. Um, it's more or less more like a balloon, okay? That's my awesome balloon. And all the galaxies are basically glued to the outside of this balloon. And as it expands, all the galaxies get further and further away because they're on this. And we can actually tell by the light coming from them. We know the speed of light and with the redshift. So anybody not familiar with redshift? Anybody know what the Doppler effect is? What's the Doppler effect in, in sound? Right, so the Doppler effect is like when you hear a tornado siren and it's faced away from you, it's a different pitch than when it's facing at you. It's because the wavelengths either compress or expand. The longer the expansion, the higher pitch it sounds, the lower the expansion, the lower pitch. Same is true with light. Things moving away from you, the light gets elongated because it's moving away from you. It takes longer for the light to come back to you. The longer the thing, the more red it looks because it's going to the infrared specter. So if it's moving away from you from a very high rate of speed, it'll look redder. If it's moving towards you, it compresses the light, makes it look bluer. So that's called redshift. So based on redshift, we can tell what's moving away from us and at what speeds based on the light coming back on the spectral scale. So that, that's part of this cosmology 101, how they tell things. So we can tell that all these galaxies, we discovered this, every galaxy we can see is moving away from us at the same rate of speed. So as it expands, they all move away from each other. But again, yeah, like Brian said, we can collapse that back using those same mathematical principles and get to where there was a definite beginning where it collapses in on itself and there's no more space. <clears throat> All right, so the next, anybody question on this? Understand expansion of the universe. So that is the question about as far as how much it's expanding? I mean, because if you say, if you can say that the beginning happened here, right. Is there an agreement or is there... As far as a point? Yeah. Well, see, and that's, that's assuming that like, it's more like a, we're in a bubble and you could go back to the middle of the bubble. But again, it's, it's, it's a balloon. So the whole balloon, you're on kind of the outside of the universe looking through nothing to the other side, basically. It's, it's very complicated and no, I don't think there's a total agreement on this, but we can do is mathematically trace it back to where there's not enough space for anything to be. And that's probably where got, they got the dot from. Trace it back and it all compresses down to one little dot and then they probably ended there and just said, oh, well, once we get everything down to that little infinitesimal dot, of existence, but that dot isn't floating in space, that dot is space. That's all the existence. So then you gotta take it one step further and say that dot wasn't even there to begin with. Okay, so next one, R. Radiation from the explosion, background radiation. If the universe exploded, so this is the idea they have. If the universe exploded into existence, then we should see radiation on a cosmic firestorm level. Much to our surprise, when we got into space, we found radiation everywhere, from every angle, like an ether permeating through the universe. So this is different than the ether idea, but basically what they said is, okay, if the universe exploded into existence, we should see radiation. Radiation is heat, radiation is light, radiation is it's all the fundamental underpinnings of life. So we should see it everywhere. It should permeate the entire universe. Well, when we got up there, we finally went to space and we started measuring radiation. What we found is trace radiation coming at us from every angle possible. So what that says is that, yes, the universe exploded into existence and this radiation is just everywhere in space. And, you know, we come to just say, oh, it's just background radiation. But that's one of the proofs that the universe began to exist. 
G, galaxy seed beds. So basically the idea is that if galaxies formed after the Big Bang, we should see ripples in the radiation. Well, we do. And they're so precise that some have called them the fingerprints of the maker. So basically, the universe blows into existence and then everything forms, right? Basically what Genesis 1, 1 to 1, 2 says, the earth was void and without form. So it goes from everything comes into existence to everything then becomes formed. And basically what they're saying is then you should see this like ripple effect as everything comes together and is formed in the radiation. And we do. We see them surrounding galaxies and stuff when we look at them, that these ripples all moving and forming them together. And they're so precise mathematically that some people have joked, because they're naturalists and they don't believe in God, they've joked and said, these are the fingerprints of the maker. I would say they actually are. <laughs> That's God's actual working that you can see in his creation where he did something and you can see the effects of it. So E. Einstein's theory of relativities. So, top of page five. Not to be confused with his special theory of relativity. In his special version, he divided by zero to av avoid the unsettling conclusion that the universe had a beginning and therefore needed a creator. So that's, that's the final proof. Einstein, I don't really know the ins and outs of Einstein's theory, but I know that his first one is still to this day held. They know it's correct. The special one has been thrown away. The reason is because he divided by zero to get rid of the beginning of the universe. He did not want that. You can't divide by zero. Right. And every, every elementary school kid knows you do not multiply or divide by zero. Well, if you divide by zero, it'll blow up the program. Right. There you go. It'll blow up the program. So he was doing it on paper or chalkboard, so it didn't blow up the chalkboard. But <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a computer program. Right. So it was a good thing he didn't, else he would have lost all his work. But, uh, and he did. That's why he admitted to it later that he, he divided by zero to avoid there needing to be a beginning of the universe. He wanted the universe to be ever existent. Later on, once he came to realize it, he started being more of a deist and then eventually getting toward that because he realized this was not possible. His theory proved there was a beginning of the universe, and if there is a beginning, there has to be something to start it, and it can't be itself. The universe can't start itself because it didn't exist to start itself. So, the implication of the Big Bang is that the universe had an absolute beginning, and before it, nothing existed, including time. This means that the universe needed a cause to bring it into existence. Next, we'll consider philosophy. One philosophic argument is that it's impossible to traverse an infinite. If the past were infinite, we would never have existed. Like a never-ending marathon where the finish line moves away as well as the start line, the runner could never start the race, finish, or pass anything. So think of it as you have a guy, he's gonna run a marathon, you have a path, right? Every race has a designated course. Marathon, it might be down streets, take this turn, take this turn, they got signs and they got barriers, don't go out of bounds, blah, blah, blah. Well, say you got the finish line over here and he's got a, what does he have to do to win? He's at the starting line. To win a race, legally, what's he gotta do? He's got to start at the starting line. When the gun goes off, they say go, whatever. He's got to take the course laid out for him, and he's got to cross the finish line. So we can imagine that the gun goes off, and they, this is in the back of a pickup truck, and the pickup truck just takes off, right? He can forever chase that truck, right? But as he passes things, trees, whatever else, he is the present. So this is the past, this is the future, and the future and the past are tied together by an infinitesimally small amount of time called the present. If you think about it, everything I'm about to say is the future, as soon as I say it, it's the past. So the present is really immeasurably small. All it does is tie what is about to happen to what already happened. So as he runs, he's tying the future to the past. 
And as he passes trees and mailboxes and cars and, and people watching, they go behind him. Now he can chase that truck forever, chase that finish line on into infinity, that's not a problem. The problem is, what if this was in a truck and this took off this direction as soon as the gun went off? So this one takes off in that direction, that one takes off in that direction. Now what's he got to do to legally finish that race? He's got to chase the start line to be able to start from the start line. If he's always chasing that start line, is he ever going to get to the, the finish line? No. So that's the philosophical, the basic idea that if there's an eternal past, the present never would be. It would always be chasing that past to be able to basically animate anything happening to tie to the future. He can't ever start that race if that starting line takes off infinity. He can forever chase the future and things will actually happen, but he can't chase both. So, this is similar, back to the notes, uh, the square bullet point. This is similar to the science argument related to the second law of thermodynamics and the universe expanding. Because we exist, because we're having this conversation, we know the present is like now, 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 now. So it's moving. It's moving toward the future, always. Because we're here having this conversation, we know that that past had a starting point, had to actually start. The present had to start sometime. So, any questions on that? Does the illustration help? I think you should clarify that what the illustration, the illustration is trying to explain why philosophically an, e, an eternal state universe cannot exist. Right. It does not address the question that an eternal God Correct. exists before the beginning. Right. So this is any, right, because God is outside of time, obviously this doesn't matter to him. What this matters to is our universe. Our universe, physical universe, that is bound to time, hard to time, hard to space, hard to matter and energy, cannot exist in this state. It so can't. what evolutionary science wants you to believe is that those flags are moving in opposite directions. <sighs> they wanted to until this started being yeah. a fact. Until it started being a fact that the universe had a beginning, they wanted this to be the case because then they had an infinite amount of time for all their theories. <clears throat> but I think there's a disconnect right now between what academic scientists know right. and what the on-the-street evolutionists right. or non-believer of God says. And that's, that's what I would caution you again, like when we talked about the other week about uh, quantum physics, quantum mechanics, stuff like that. There is a very big difference between what is argued in academia and what is trickled down in popularity to, to people who aren't in this field or aren't in those fields. And yeah, they, they popularize, somebody picks up on it, they popularize it in a movie, and they just put out a movie to make money and people start going, oh, that's so cool. And then they know maybe what that movie said and an article on Facebook. And that's all they know. And so, yeah, you're going to deal with some of this. That's why we do, I, I'm doing it this way is because this is a very easy illustration to give to any person you will meet on the street to demonstrate the past cannot be eternal. Not in this universe. And if they're going to say some other universe and say, well, show me proof that I should ever believe that there's another universe other than wanting it to exist. I read, uh, I read a paper the other day and it was 10, 10 proofs why the multiverse exists. You want to know how many of those 10 proofs are actually proofs? No. Zero. Every one of the 10 proofs was actually wishful thinking. <laughs> if it were true, it would solve this problem for us. If it were true, it would solve this problem for us. If it were true, it would solve this problem for us. And it was all problems based on naturalism not admitting there's a God. That's basically all it was. Between the two finish, or Start. starting and finish line, basically isn't that what we would call time? And then we had eternity past, before that eternity future. <clears throat> Right, some have described time as the, the interim period between the two eternities. Yeah. However, before this, time didn't exist. God existed in a timeless state. He transcends time, there is no time. So there was no eternity temporal past. No. Time came into existence at the start line. Eternity, when I think of eternity, I think of 
not something without beginning or end. Correct, which is impossible to think about with with what we're in. Right. <laughs> yeah, the that's the disconnect. It's, it's hard for us because that's all we think about is time. That's all we've ever known. That's all we ever experience. We, we live in time. Right. Uh, but God existed before time began, and He will exist. After. Correct. In a non-temporal state, he existed. You know, he didn't. He transcends times. He's eternal, and that's the problem. Is often eternal and time get put together when they shouldn't be. Eternal is is something else entirely. It's non-temporal to begin with. No beginning or end. No time in the middle. So yes, God. That's fine. That's what Brian was saying. God can exist back here, back here, back before time. The time before time. No, right, the non-time, we can't. Within our language, we cannot explain these things because our language is bound hard to the idea of time. You know, if I say before time, I'm using a time before time, before, prior to. So we, with the language the way it is, I can't describe time without no time. Time only relates to human beings, right? This universe. Huh? This universe, the cosmos. What I mean yes. Is, God is eternal even during time. Mm -hmm. You know, even during what we call time. In other words, we're, we're in time right now, but God is still eternal. Right. Yes. Uh, so basically, time only applies to us as human beings, right? Yeah, it applies to His creation. Right. So anything He created would would be in this yeah. area. Yeah. Like I said, it's it's almost impossible to describe God before because before is temporal. That's a past statement. And now I'm describing time before time began, which is non-existent. Yeah, this is why if you read theology books, they talk, they'll talk about the ineffability of God. And what they're talking about is the fact that God, you cannot, God transcends the ability of human language to fully explain right. some of this stuff. Yeah. So like Nate said, well, before time, God existed. Well, the word before is a time word. Yeah. Before church, I drove to church. But God just was. Right. Yeah. That's why it just says, in the beginning, God. Yeah. He was just in a state of being that did not require and does not require time, space, matter, energy, any of that stuff. But it's impossible to fully articulate. Okay, so, last of all, theology. In the beginning, the first phrase found in the Bible, the word translated being is the Hebrew root word uh, rashith, meaning first in place, time, order, rank, beginning, chief, first principle thing. Traditionally, it has been explained that from the first moments of time, space, matter, and energy, it has been explained as the first moments of time, space, matter, and energy. Before this beginning, nothing existed except the self-existent triune God. At first, this was not accepted, as Kreft and Toselli state in their book, Handbook of Christian Apologetics. Quote, when Jewish and Christian theologians first talked to Greek philosophers, the Greeks thought the biblical notion that God created the world ex nihilo, ex nihilo out of nothing was absurd and irrational because it violated the law, a law of nature that ex nihilo nihil fit, out of nothing, nothing comes. This law is a true law of nature and still holds today. So why is the concept of creation ex nihilo not irrational and does not, in fact, break this law? Two reasons. Because if, because God, if he exists, is all-powerful and cannot be expected to be contained by the laws of nature he, he created. Um, it seems pretty self-explanatory. If God created those laws, he can use them however he feels like it. And two, because creation ex nihilo does not actually break this law since there was a God to create and therefore a sufficient cause existed. The problem the Greeks had was that when we said creation ex nihilo, they understood that everything had to have a cause. So the universe coming into existence out of nothing to them was absurd because everything needs a cause. What could cause the universe to come into existence out of nothing? It doesn't actually break that law if we assume that we have a transcendent, all-powerful God to do it. He is now the sufficient cause. 
It might be helpful underneath where you have begin, mm -hmm. infinity or begin, to put three arrows. So if it, if it's, if it did begin, what are the options? It's either, it's either was self-caused. We'll, yeah, we'll get there. Okay. We'll get there. <laughs> Those are more splits to come. So the next split. Was the beginning caused or uncaused? Oh, there you go. There you go. See? Segway. You read the note, didn't you? No. This was, I teach similar stuff to my philosophy students. All right. Again, or. Uh -huh. Caused or uncaused. There is no other option. So, was the beginning caused or uncaused? Job 38, 3 through 4. Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand thee and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. This one seems obvious, so I won't spend much time on it. Just as with the last split, science, philosophy, and theology all agree that the universe must have a cause. Nothing comes into existence without a sufficient reason for doing so. We know that every action has a reaction. For every effect, there, is, there must be a cause of that effect. We know this, right? You guys learned this in grade school. For every action, there is an opposite and equal reaction. Everything we see in the world is an effect, basically. You see effects, and it works in reverse. If I see an effect, that means that effect had to be caused by something. Something had to make that happen, and then something made that happen, and something made that happen, and something made that happen back and back and back. This is another one of those cannot be infinite. I cannot have an infinite amount of causations. There has to be, at some point, a first cause or a primary cause. So I'm not going to spend much time on that one just because that's the option. It began, was it uncaused or caused? Well, clearly science, philosophy, and theology all agree it's caused. So as you can see here, as we go down through this, every time we get to a split, we're taking the road of science, philosophy, and theology. Science, philosophy, theology. Science, philosophy, theology. You guys see the trend? All the major ways of knowing anything that we know tell us this is the case. The other reason why I like using a model like this is because it gets you to agree with somebody who disagrees with you. Say they don't believe in God. They're probably going to believe that the universe exists. You can probably show them very easily that it had to have a beginning, and they will agree. You probably can show them that it has a cause, just from what they know from elementary school, and so you get them to agree with you, agree with you, agree with you. So go to the next page, and you get to the final split. This is where all the problems come in. Was that cause to the beginning of the existence of the universe personal or impersonal? Did someone design and create it, or did some random directionless force do it? That is an oxymoron. A random directionless force cannot do anything by, <laughs> by its own definition, only until it has things to affect. So the problem here is that if someone has been paying attention down through this argument, science, philosophy, and theology have all been in agreement on which option you should choose. Every other option ends in despair and pointlessness. This is why many atheists live in despair and write about the hopelessness of our situation. A random directionless force, if it could pre-exist the universe, cannot do anything if it has nothing to affect. That is to say, if there was no matter, space, or time, nothing, then the force would do nothing because it couldn't. The only option available is that a person willed it. So in every one of these categories, these all ultimately end in pointlessness, hopelessness, and despair. There is no point to the universe. There is no point to the universe. There's no point to life. There's no point to death. There's no point to anything. They all end in despair. And they're all non-consistent with science, philosophy, and theology. If you stay consistent, you end up with a personal creator. This impersonal force, the force they want to talk to you about, if it pre-existed the universe, if that were possible, it's a directionless, random force 
A force can only force things that exist. If nothing existed but this force, nothing would have happened ever because there's nothing for it to affect. You know, we, we talk about nothing, and I say nothing a lot, and people get confused on that word. I don't know why. Nothing is what rocks dream about, okay? It's not anything. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you can't say that, you know, Krauss wanted to do this. He, he wrote a book called The Universe from Nothing, where he tries to explain how the universe could come into existence by this. And what he does is he equivocates or changes the meaning of the word nothing and tries to tell you that nothing was actually something. And there was something before there was anything. And then that force, there was negative and positive energies and in this vacuum state that then the force could work on. There, you know, that, again, that goes against the Big Bang and everything else. It's just, they have to go to these places though. They have to go to these places and say these things because this is where it leads. This is where all the evidence leads. So if I'm going to believe in an impersonal force, you have to believe in in matter that existed before it right, existed. But I also am believing in something that can't be proven scientifically. Correct. If I'm going to believe in an eternal God, I'm also believing in something. So it doesn't matter where you're at. At some point, you have to exercise right. faith. Right. You have to make a faith statement at any of these junctures. To to go with this one, this is where the evidence is. To go with this one, you have to make a blind leap because science cannot say this. You have to do exactly what they accuse Christians. Correct. Of. That's why they, they often accuse us of, of worshiping the God of the gaps. Basically, we don't understand how this happened, so God did it. You know, old school, you know, thunder, lightning, God's bowling or something. Okay, so that's the God of the gaps idea. But this is exactly the dot of the gaps idea for them. They have to make this blind leap not supported in actual science or philosophy to say either it's not created, it's an infinite past, or it's uncaused, or it was an impersonal force that did it. Those are all metaphysical statements. They go beyond the physical world. They go beyond math. They go beyond all these things and go outside of our universe, which is non-testable or verifiable for science. Science cannot verify or falsify that statement. And that's why they hold to it a lot of times, because now I can't definitely say they're wrong. I can just show them what science says. So they have to deny science to support science. Amen. <laughs> they do. They have, they have to deny the, the underpinnings, the, the pivotal, necessary underpinnings of science, which are, we're testing what is, what is the universe. What, why do things happen? And we have to disregard all the rules of science to say this but we have to say that because we don't want this so concluding remarks got like five minutes one thing I would want to draw attention to is the fact that the Big Bang Theory matches almost verbatim to the creation narrative only stopping short of saying God did it this is interesting to me that the Bible claims God created everything and before this there was nothing. So does the Big Bang. It also says that everything came into existence in one massive explosion of being. Well, the Bible says God spoke it into existence. One interesting coincidence is that scientists claim there were six singularities that proceeded immediately before the Big Bang, so the explosion is the seventh. It's just an odd number that... They say that's a fact, that there were six singularities and the seventh singularity, everything came into existence. It's just a weird number that they would go with seven. <laughs> it's an odd number, a little conspiratorial, but I found it interesting. So my conclusion is that the Bible claims God created ex nihilo, and the Big Bang, we find proof of it actually happening. Finally, I want to look at the implications of the cosmological argument in comparison to the scriptures. Certain attributes of this personal creator can be brought to light when we reflect on the argument. Do these, argument, or do these attributes match what the Bible teaches about God? So, point one, the cosmo proves a person created everything ex nihilo. So Genesis 1.1 says there was a beginning and God was the creator. So, this, ha this had to be a person to choose to create. This person had to have a will or volition. 
Job 38, which we referred to before, says God designed the universe. He uses the imagery of a builder measuring and leveling the world. Three, he must be incredibly powerful to create out of nothing by his own power. Genesis 18.26 tells us nothing is too hard for him, while Matthew 19.26 says all things are possible with him. Job 26.14 says his power is beyond understanding. So for him to create with such precision and design, he must be immensely intelligent. Psalms 147.5 describes his wisdom as infinite. For him to create time, he must be eternal or non-temporal. Romans 1.20 says his eternal power. Isaiah 26.4 says everlasting. For him to create all matter and space, he cannot be corporeal or take up space. John 4.24 says God is a spirit. A spirit by definition is not anything physical, not any physical object made up of matter. If the world is designed, then the world must can have purpose. I could give dozens of references for this. The Bible is screaming out what the purpose is. 1 Timothy 1.17 says, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, and invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Our existence is to bring honor and glory to our Creator. This is why the world rejects God. Because we come to realize that the universe does not revolve around us, as many flat earthers like to believe but centers in Christ and the God who made it all and deserves all. This realization means that I am not number one, but a servant to a higher authority. This authority trumps all men, systems, governments, and kingdoms. This authority calls all men to re react to the gospel, to follow God or reject him. This authority says we exist to bring glory, to bring him glory and not glory in self. For most people, this re realization is unacceptable. C.S. Lewis once said, quote, There are only two kinds of people in the end, those who say to God, Thy will be done, and those to whom God says, Thy will be done. All, are in hell, all that are in hell choose it. Again, he says elsewhere, quote, I willingly believe that the damned are, in one sense, successful, rebels to the end, that the doors of hell are locked on the inside. Here, on, on Lewis's view, as well as mine, People willingly choose hell as the better option for themselves. God gives men many proofs of his existence in nature, as well as a written revelation in scripture. But God is not in the business of forcing us to choose, but allowing all men the chance to respond to the gospel and accept him. Sadly, some, nay most, never will. So we are out of time if there's any quick questions off camera, I guess. Oh, I got a couple minutes. So I got well, Romans 1.20. Mm -hmm. talking about the invisible things that come from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Mm -hmm. Being understood by the things that are made. Right. So if you want to... Your last point here where you're going through what all this says about God. Right. You got to those conclusions by looking at, well, what did God make and how did he do it? Right. And then second, when you're talking about the equivocation of the atheist and the unbeliever, because verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful and became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. Right. Only a foolish, darkened heart would say that impersonal forces, no cause, all this stuff would is better than believing in what logically makes sense and is consistent. Correct. And, and we'll start to look at those passages actually next week when we look at some of the teleological arguments for the existence of God, which is looking at the design of the universe itself and seeing where there's beauty and design and there's things that cannot just happen on their own. They have to have a hand in it. So, yeah, you know, good point. That's a good segue into next week's lesson, actually. <laughs>